Hello and welcome everyone. Today I'll be covering the electrical systems on board the Phoenix A320. Before we begin though, a couple of small notes. The first, in the interest of brevity and keeping things as concise as possible, I'll be making use of editing and some cutting to ensure that the episode doesn't spiral out of control. The second is that this is an alpha project and therefore a work in progress. As we go through these systems, should something inaccurate, incomplete, or buggy catch your eye, please remember that we likely already know about it and have it noted down. With that said, on to the topic at hand. The electrical system on board this aircraft, as with most modern aircraft, is genuinely a very fascinating, complex, and, and almost overwhelming topic. Electricity is a lifeblood for an aircraft like this, very similar to how one would consider fuel or hydraulic fluid a core and critical consumable to keeping the aircraft safely flying through the sky. Now this means that there is a significant amount of complexity and intricacy when it comes to handling the electrical system, and that includes all of its automation and redundancies. I'm going to go ahead and try and pack as much as possible into this single episode, but I'm almost certainly not going to be able to cover everything. I'll consider that a good thing for the moment, however, as when you get the aircraft, that means you'll have stuff left over to try for yourself. Let's begin with a circuit diagram of the aircraft. I'll run through a brief overview of what we're dealing with here before we move into more specific areas. So here's the circuit diagram for the A320. It's a three phase 115 slash 200 volt 400 hertz AC system and up by the top, a 28 volt DC system. We'll be starting by covering the most basic standard configuration of the electrical system when the aircraft is completely powered up with both engines running. So beginning at the bottom of the diagram, we have generator one and generator two. These are called integrated drive generators and they're abbreviated as IDGs. They're used as the main source to supply the aircraft's electrical network and are part of the engines. The IDGs essentially contain a generator and a constant speed drive. As the engines vary in speed, the constant speed drive takes that variable speed output and provides a constant output RPM. Those who have been around or work with generators know that they generally need a constant specific speed to work. Each generator then supplies a nice stable 115 volt 400 hertz alternating current to its respective bus. That is, generator 1 supplies AC bus 1, and generator 2 supplies AC bus 2. Now this is known as a split operation, and the power sources can't actually be connected in parallel. They're brought online automatically according to priority rules. So the IDGs are the highest priority, followed by external power when available, and then the APU generator. With that being said, the extensive network of contactors and relays does allow for any of these power sources, be it Gen 1, Gen 2, APU, or external power to run the entire system, and all are capable of doing so. Back to the AC buses. Now, these buses act as common points where various electrically energized components can draw power from. It simplifies the wiring and it keeps everything nice and neat. Generally, the electrical power distribution system of a large aircraft like the A320 will comprise of several or more buses. Think of it as a distribution center for components to come get their electricity. Lights, coffee warmers, the in-flight entertainment, all the way up to the captain's primary flight display, all of these are run off of the different buses on this aircraft. Now, as mentioned, the A320 requires both AC and DC power, and as we move upward through the system, we can see that these AC buses then supply power to what's known as a transformer rectifier. Now, AC bus 1 supplies TR1, and AC bus 2 supplies TR2. These 200 amp transformer rectifiers convert 115 volt AC into 28 volt DC so that the aircraft can then supply its DC buses, DC1 and DC2. Now, per the norm so far, generator 1 supplies AC bus 1, which then supplies TR1, which then supplies DC bus 1. 
Well, there's that DC power now coming out of the transformer rectifier and into DC bus one it goes and the same for the other side. So pretty simple so far, but this is where things start to get a little more complicated. Remembering that we can't have these systems in parallel, the aircraft must now choose how it wants to power the DC battery bus and the subsequent DC essential bus. The result is Airbus choosing to run these from DC bus 1 in a normal configuration. Now bearing in mind that the 1 system is also powering the AC essential bus, This means that the aircraft has a slightly imbalanced power load, and this is actually reflected in the load percentage visible on the aircraft's ELEC ECAM page. I'll point this out later when we jump into the aircraft to start poking at and consequently breaking things. Now that we have a pretty good idea of the absolute basics, let's quickly talk about these essential buses. The clue for these is in the name. This is where all the essential equipment for safe flight operations pull their power from. Remember when I said it's sort of like a distribution center for components to come get their electricity? Well, this is almost the VIP line, and these associated shed buses right here, these are part of that, except for when power is severely limited. For example, if all you had left were the batteries powering the aircraft in a catastrophic failure, those shed buses are, well, they're shed. They're disconnected as they're considered less important than the life-saving stuff wired into these essential buses. And in that situation, it is imperative to extend the endurance of the aircraft with that final line of essential systems. An example of a shed component would be the motors for the cross-feed valves. Motor 1 is hooked into this DC essential shed bus, and motor 2 is actually hooked into the regular old DC bus 2. So in the event DC bus 2 fails, we still have control over the crossfeed. But if we're in an emergency electrical situation and load shedding is occurring, the crossfeed isn't considered important enough to remain powered. Finally, the last few important bits of the diagram here. The aircraft can run on battery power only, thanks to this static inverter making it possible for the DC supplying battery to provide AC power to the AC essential bus. For those who aren't familiar, a static inverter performs a fairly similar role to a standard uninterruptible power supply, and provides a continuous or standby source of AC power from a DC supply. So these batteries right here and provide power via this static inverter which essentially does the exact opposite of the transformer rectifier and provides AC power to this AC essential bus. So on a quick first peek this does indeed look to be an absolute labyrinth of wiring and components. With that being said I'm happy to say that we've modeled this entire system in exacting detail from relays to contactors, down to the wiring behind individual buttons, switches, and enunciators being connected to the correct buses, and then implementing specific power buffers for those individual components that affects their startup and shutdown procedures. Certain components on the flight deck even have their memory dump processes built into the logic, so when you interrupt them, fail them, or simply switch them off, they should respond appropriately to being switched back on again, depending on how long they've been in inactive. With 282 active circuit breakers, when I say components, I do not simply mean components within the ELEC system. I mean components on the aircraft that require electricity themselves. So when you think or use a sim aircraft, it's not often you think about what's directly behind the interface that you're using. In real life, displays, panels, switches, and components are powered by and wired into a power source. The goal here was for most items that you look at, interact with, and utilize to have a deeper than simply surface level effect on this massive machine that you're operating, from the smallest switch to the largest generator. There is an ethos here of programming the correct logic into the component so it responds to an input correctly on its own as opposed to simply coding in an effect. 
I'll circle back to this when we dive a little deeper, but just bear that in mind as you continue to watch on. Now, the ELEC system is interesting. However, it is rarely interacted with, if at all, during a regular flight. Everything is automatic, which seems simple to you guys because it's hardly ever thought of, but of course, the logic and implementation here is also as deep as everything else. So the aircraft uses the correct logic to respond to specific situations as demanded by the control computers monitoring the system and its requirements. So let's start looking a little bit deeper at the aircraft and we'll begin with the batteries. The batteries on the A320 are made of nickel cadmium, like most aircraft in class. Now, nickel cadmium is used due to its interesting discharge characteristics. Unlike certain other types of batteries, lead acid batteries like in cars for example, a nickel cadmium's battery's terminal voltage only changes a little bit as it discharges. Now this makes the modeling of its charge and discharge characteristics relatively unique and something that we've actually gone through and replicated. This will be visible in the overhead battery voltage meters, and I'll demonstrate this momentarily. If we bring up our circuit diagram once again, in addition to the discharge characteristics, the charge logic is also fully simulated. And by that, I mean the battery charge limiter, which controls the operation of the automatic contactors that connect the battery to the rest of the network. Those are found here. You'll notice that the switches for the batteries go from auto to off, so definitely not a simple boolean. In auto mode, it introduces the batteries to the electrical system as and when it deems necessary based on the configuration and state of the aircraft. This list of conditions is available at the FCOM, and you can see a multitude of conditions ranging from inoperative components to aircraft speed. All of this information is being correctly fed into the BCL to allow it to go through the decision-making process for itself and come up with its output. A very simple and quick demonstration would be to run the battery through a couple of abridged checks. In order to do this, we'll trigger a charging cycle, so ground power is switched on and we switch off both batteries. Now it's interesting to note here that because the engines are on, the batteries weren't connected to the DC battery bus and therefore there was no voltage change when you switch the batteries off. However, if the batteries were connected or the aircraft were drawing power from them, switching the batteries off will cause a small fluctuation in the voltmeter. Now remember, we're not exactly switching off the batteries here, we're just telling the BCL to open the contactors and disconnect the battery from the DC battery bus, therefore isolating it from the rest of the network. As you don't get a clear picture of what the true voltage of the battery is otherwise, due to the load being drawn and whatnot. Now these displays on the overhead, these are hooked up to the battery hot bus, so they're also theoretically isolated from the rest of the network with the battery too which is why you can see the voltage change occasionally when the battery contactor is open and load is withdrawn from the battery. This is now a more true reading of what the battery is doing. So there's one check here and this applies if the aircraft has not been electrically supplied for more than 6 hours. And that is to ensure that the battery voltage is above 25.5 volts, anything lower is considered too low. Now interestingly, as mentioned before, these nickel cadmium batteries have an interesting voltage dis discharge characteristic. Battery voltage above 25.5 volts indicates roughly a charge above 50%, definitely far from linear. However, the reason this check is for an aircraft that hasn't been supplied for longer than 6 hours is because the voltage reading on the overhead is still potentially influenced by remnants of charger energy. It simply hasn't been isolated for long enough. Now we're quite comfortably and nicely above 25.5 volts, but of course the IDGs are connected and the generators are providing power to the airplane. So let's move on to the next check. Airbus says if the aircraft has been electrically supplied in the last 6 hours to trigger a recharge cycle. Now this is done by switching off the battery switches and then switching them back into auto. This triggers a charge cycle according to the BCL logic, so both contactors close. Now, I'm going to go ahead and do this. And you can see on the synoptic here, both contactors close. Now the aircraft is charging its batteries, and what you're looking for is a decreasing amp value, dropping below 60 amps within 10 seconds. 
Interestingly, here you can see a nice little side effect of simulating this as deeply as possible. Looking at the volt reading on the overhead, you'll see it jumped up to 28.6 volts. This is because the contactor has closed and this allows us to charge the battery, and in doing so, we're now getting a reading from the charger output voltage on the overhead. Part of the reason why checking voltage under 6 hours from charging invalidates the accuracy of just the volt readings on the overhead. On a final note with the batteries, let's start the APU really quick and I'll be able to demonstrate the resulting effect on the batteries. So, most of the APU logic and system logic is controlled by the electronic control box, or the ECB. The ECB controls the electric starter for the APU, and both the electric starter and the ECB supply are wired into the DC battery bus, so the DC battery bus is providing power for both the electric starter and the ECB. Now, there's no indication of the APU starter motor engaging on the APU ECAM page, but you can actually see this occur from the overhead battery voltmeters by observing the voltage fluctuation as the start process occurs. I'll now start the APU, and you can observe the overhead voltmeters. In fact, let's switch it over to the APU ECAM page. So, you can see the flap is open and the starter motor has engaged, and as a result of that, the battery voltmeters have started reading less voltage. Now, they're doing this because the batteries are now under load, and as per the rules of how um, electricity works in general, when you put something under load, the volts are going to drop just a little bit. And you can even see where the starter motor disengages and is no longer required, and the volts jump up again because the batteries are no longer discharging. Now, interesting to note here is that the batteries have consumed some of their power or energy, and they're currently reading a, volt, a voltage reading less than they had before the start, so it has consumed some energy or some charge from the batteries. But as I mentioned, these nickel cadmium batteries, they don't really deal with voltage in exactly the same way as another battery. Here you end up in a situation where a significant amount of charge has been used, but the voltage only drops by 0.2 or 0.3 volts. Charge to voltage is not a linear relationship in this case. Okay, so for the next set of demonstrations, let's move on to observing the automatic switching logic for the contactors and relays. We're going to fail TR1 and we're going to observe the system response, so that's TR1 right here. We're going to fail this and uh, we're going to watch what the system does. But this happens fairly quickly, so I'll run us through what to expect uh, before it occurs so that you may observe it happening. Now what we're looking for here is the aircraft is going to kick the contactor above the fail TR, it's going to open that. Okay, and it, then it's going to reroute power via this essential TR right here. So this essential TR will act as a redundant system for TR1 or TR2. So power has now power can no longer go this way. So it's now coming through here, and it's coming through the essential transfer. So system two will then theoretically co uh, close this DC tie contactor up here. So this will then snap shut and it will drive power to the DC battery bus and to DC bus 1. So that's now being fed from generator 2 and AC bus 2 uh, has taken over DC battery bus and DC bus 1. Now we should see some momentary loss of power with certain lights and such as the contactors open and close and a power interruption occurs. Okay, so on to the demonstration and uh, just have a look at the lights and whatnot and you'll be able to sort of see them flicker just as the aircraft opens and closes all of the contactors and relays as it reroutes power where it needs to go so over to the elec page and there's tr1 so we'll go ahead and uh, fail tr1 now 
and you can see there really quick uh really quick interruption there but of course things like lights and whatnot they don't really have a power buffer built into them so you'll see a quick uh, flicker of the lights as the power interruption occurs um, but as you can see correct response the system has rerouted power according to the logic it's been programmed with so as you can see generator one supplying ac1 ac essential essential tr and dc essential per what we expected so as you can see ac2 so generator 2 and ac2 is powering tr2 dc2 dc battery and dc1 much as the diagram and dc essential ac essential and ac1 are all being powered from generator 1 so you can see it's actually quite a reasonable and easy to read uh synoptic uh, on the lower ecamm for the elect page now let's look at AC bus 1 and more importantly the AC essential feed that's this switch right here on the overhead that allows you to manually control the side from which the AC essential bus is feeding. As you can see here in a regular configuration it's feeding from AC bus 1 but there are a couple of switches right here and you can see it's actually depicted um, this AC essential feed switch is depicted here because this AC essential bus can be fed from either side. Now in the original implementation of this aircraft, were you to lose AC bus 1? So let's helpfully do that. So were you to lose AC bus 1, you'd lose your captain's PFD, ND and upper ECAM and a whole host of other really significant and important items as you've now lost your essential because power doesn't flow further than this. Um, so you've now lost your AC essential bus and by that way you've lost also your DC essential bus. So that's AC essential bus, DC essential bus knocked out because AC bus 1 is dead. And this switch right here is the key to it all. Now, it's not ideal from a design scenario, uh, having both essential buses go offline due to an AC bus one failure. It's not particularly great design, but still this switch exists. And if you push it, hey presto, you know, your problems are solved. The airplane has switched over to the two system and it reconfigures, but you need to press this switch. So let's give that a go. Alrighty, so let's fail AC bus 1. So there you are, there's AC bus 1, and as you can see, all of these things have just died. So, Captain's PFD, ND, Upper ECAM, and you can see you've actually got an essential bus fault as well. So, it tells you AC essential feed alternate. Now, one of the interesting things to note here, um, even the ECAM control panel, this is dead. Uh, these buttons here, these are wired. Um, these are fed by the DC essential bus and these buttons cannot be used because as I mentioned, we no longer have a DC essential bus because we've not switched over yet. So this all button right here, however, this is wired into the FWC. Now FWC one is dead because that is pulling power from the aircraft's AC essential bus. However, FWC2 is still functional because it pulls power from AC bus 2. So let's just really quickly look at this. So we've lost AC essential bus, we've lost the DC essential bus, and um, this ECAM control panel is powered by this DC essential bus, right? So the all button is wired into the FWC, however, and one of them, one of the FWCs, there's two on this aircraft, the first one is wired into um, the aircraft's AC essential bus. So again, FWC1, dead, right? FWC2, however, is pulling power from right here, and this is still powered. So we have one FWC still working, which is why whilst the rest of this doesn't work, this all button and a couple of other buttons here, these are actually wired directly into the FWCs, which means it will continue to work. You can actually use this, and this is in single ECAM mode, so that it, it does change a little bit here. Um, but as you can see, actually, if I just uh, carry on down through, you'll see at the bottom of that status list, 
um, it says FWC1 is dead. And that is very much true. So this is FWC2 that is powering specifically these buttons. So these buttons have been wired correctly to FWC2, which has then been wired correctly to the bus that it's supposed to be drawing power from, AC bus 2. Same thing with these buttons, wired correctly into where they should be going, which is the DC essential bus. And for that reason, they're dead. So let's very quickly hit that... Uh, button on the overhead AC essential feed and you can see there it's now going to slowly come back to life all of it comes back to life self-test and progress and back up it comes and you can see how the airplane there has now rerouted power so AC1 is completely invalid so as you can see the AC1 is completely invalid which means it needs to feed absolutely everything off of generator 2 because none of the rest of this can be supplied in parallel with generator 2 so it can't supply AC bus 2 as well that's just generator 2 so the reconfiguration then what happens so that is now gone so there's no more power coming from AC bus 1 what does instead happen is that TR1 is also considered dead as a result of this so this is all gone TR1 is also all gone so all of this is now without power and what the aircraft does is that it starts to route everything through AC2. So let's open this up. We'll leave it in orange so you can see where the new paths are drawn. But once we hit that switch, power could now flow from this direction. So that's only after we hit this switch, power could flow from this direction into AC Essential. So now we have AC Essential again, which is awesome. AC Essential feeds the Essential Transfer Bus, which then sends power to the DC Essential. And as a result of that, we now have the DC Essential bus coming back to life. And of course, the DC tie contactor up here is also closed so that we can supply the DC battery bus. So once again, this is now gone. So it, close, it opens these contactors and then this DC tie contactor is opened up and power goes from DC bus 2 into DC battery bus and then into DC bus 1. So that way everything is fed and the aircraft has just reconfigured itself um, to manage with this new these new power requirements. So it is now powering all buses and it's doing so from one generator. Now, this is pretty hilariously inefficient, though. Um, in the case of an AC bus 1 failure, you're losing some seriously critical bits of equipment until you simply push a button. So Airbus later decided to automate this um, and offered it as a retrofit option on older aircraft. Um, so most newer aircraft now have this automated. Uh, and as a result of that, we've actually uh, built this option into the Phoenix. So you can choose uh, which one you like. So if you go over to aircraft config here and you can see AC essential feed auto switching. So let's just turn that on really quick. And um, we can go through and let's again, using extremely technical terms, let's unfail AC bus one. And we'll go on to the overhead and we'll just set everything back to a completely normal configuration. So you can see on the ELEC page there, completely normal configuration. Now that we've switched this option, let's go ahead and fail. Okay, so now that we've switched this option on, let's go ahead and fail AC bus one. And you can see it just automatically reroutes power on its own, right? Nothing, nothing to be done there. It has automatically, and you can see the AC ESS feed alternate. So I just go up to the overhead and you can see here the AC essential feed alternate light has illuminated of its own. Um, so it's doing that by itself, which is pretty cool. So the automatic switching working a treat there and uh, important to note, no interruption to the displays because it does switch it over so quickly um, that the power buffer for the displays is strong enough to maintain power through the quick contactor switch. Um, on older EIS-1 aircraft, this is a little bit of a different story, but EIS-2 with the newer LCD panels, they have an improved buffer. So this is quite apparent when you pull the aircraft into stand and you turn the engines off. Um, and then the APU takes uh, takes up the load uh, or ground power, whatever you, you may have. 
Um, as the electrical load shifts, the EIS-1 displays would kind of do a quick flicker, but the EIS-2 uh, aircraft do not. Now, let's talk a little bit about loading up the ELEC systems network. So I touched on the fact that there is asymmetric load on the aircraft. And if we look at the ECAM ELEC page down here, you can see a quick uh, percentage there of uh, the loads that the generators are currently uh, experiencing. Um, and you can see with Gen 1 running a little bit of an increased load compared to Gen 2. So what's kind of interesting here is that you can sort of start to have a little play with this and observe how the aircraft's electrical demand changes as you start turning on or off certain systems. Um, so let's go and turn off this commercial push button on the overhead. Um, and short of having some grumpy customers in the back seats, uh, this is a surefire way of reducing some demand on the generators. So again, you can see as I push that in and kind of switch that off, uh, the generator load drops on Gen 1 and Gen 2. Uh, as a quick side note, of course, the load percentage is a value that we're currently tweaking and tuning. So if it's 4% uh, instead of 6%, uh, just bear that in mind. That's still something we're working on. But as a proof of concept here, as you turn that off, you can see the load kind of the, the load kind of falls away just a little bit. So what's on this commercial push button? Well, we've got, you know, cabin cargo lights, water and toilet systems, drain mast ice protection, passenger entertainment systems, uh, the in-seat power supply. All of that has just been disabled when we push that. And you can see the load that reduces on the generators as a result of that. Uh, as you can imagine, all of that tends to draw quite a lot of power from the aircraft and switching it off as demonstrated reduces the load quite dramatically. So the aircraft does inhibit or shed these loads itself uh, on occasion too. So for example, if I were to switch off generator one for the purposes of demonstration, you'll see that generator two will then automatically open and close the relevant contactors and relays to power AC bus one as well as AC bus two. Now this will more than double its initial power demand given that generator two will be supplying the entire system including the AC and DC essential buses, DC bus one and the DC battery bus. So in order to protect the system, because this is now, you know, you'd, you'd essentially be transferring all of this load across over to generator two. So in order to then protect the system, the aircraft will shed the galley. So the galley tends to be one of the more voracious, uh, but non-flight relevant consumers of electricity on board the aircraft and it will decide to do this automatically as a result of the increased load on Gen 2. So let's just go ahead and pop this off really quick so you'll be able to see. And you can see as it reconfigures right there, you've got 32% Gen 1 is off, but it does let you know, and it says galley shed. So the galley is now not powered and we can't have coffee and that makes the pilots very, very upset from what I'm, uh, from what I'm aware. So we'll just quickly turn that on again. Um, but it does this, you know, in an attempt to minimize energy consumption while running on a single generator configuration. So even if I were to turn it off again and it tells you galley shed, pushing this right here, um, the galley and cab push button, as you can see, it does nothing to the load demand of the aircraft because it's already just been automatically shed. So this is not doing much to our, uh, to our load figure there. So let's move on to talking about the emergency electrical configuration. On the overhead, there is this section, emergency electrical power, and you can trigger the emergency generator by unlatching this cover and pushing this button below it. This is a ground test that's normally handled by maintenance, but we'll give it a go anyway. Now, the emergency generator is a hydraulically powered generator and it runs off of the blue system. The ram air turbine connects to the blue system and pressurizes it, which then allows the emergency generator to work. Now, this is how the aircraft provides power when all else fails and there's a catastrophic uh, failure. Now, normally in the event the aircraft needs the ram air turbine, it will generally automatically deploy it. For example, if AC bus 1 and AC bus 2 were to both fail, the ram air turbine is automatically deployed provided the aircraft is traveling at greater than 100 knots. We'll come back to that in just a second. For now, if you want, you could also manually deploy the ram air turbine, or you can use this emergency generator test to use the blue hydraulic system to run that emergency generator just to give it a short test. I'm going to go ahead and set the ECAM to its default page, 
and we'll test this functionality. So upon holding down this emergency generator test with both AC buses powered, a couple of things should happen. The first is that the Ecamm ELEC page should be brought up automatically if we're on the ground, which we are. And next, the AC essential and DC essential buses are connected to the emergency generator. Finally, the Ecamm ELEC page should display a shed message for the AC essential and DC essential buses to indicate that the aircraft is load shedding due to being powered by the emergency generator. So let's see what happens. Press and hold. So there you go. Good result. The ECAM switched over automatically. The essential bus is hooked up and shed. And now we know this incredibly important feature works in the first place. So now we can go start breaking stuff. And the first thing we're going to start doing is by dropping the aircraft into its emergency electrical configuration. Okay, so we're now in the air at 5,000 feet and doing 250 knots. We're going to kill AC bus 1 and 2, and that should drop us right into emergency electrical configuration. And because our speed is greater than 100 knots, on activation of this failure, the ram air turbine should drop out on its own. Now, it takes a few seconds for the ram air turbine to extend and for the emergency generator coupling to hook up, so you'll see the aircraft go through a couple of phases here. In that interim period, which is roughly around 3 to 5 seconds, the batteries will jump in and power the AC and DC essential buses. You can tell that the aircraft is in this transitory phase by taking a look at the navigation display. When it pops back up to life, the aircraft is being powered by the ram air turbine and the emergency generator is coupled. This is because the captain's navigation display is considered an AC essential shed item and is therefore not powered in the interest of maximizing battery endurance. Once the emergency generator is brought online, the AC essential shed bus is reconnected to the AC essential bus and those components are energized once again. A couple of fun notes about the Ram Air Turbine. We've simulated the effect of airflow over the ram air turbine, so it speeds up and slows down depending on the air being forced past it by the aircraft's speed, which invariably means that once you drop below 100 knots, the ram air turbine will cease to pressurize the blue hydraulic line, and therefore the emergency generator. Interestingly, the recommendation from Airbus is 140 knots minimum. This is due to early A320 aircraft having slightly smaller diameter ram air turbine blades and the gear extension would tend to disturb the airflow towards the ram air turbine. So the nose gear would disturb the airflow towards the ram air turbine and this would cause the blades to stall and cease pressurizing the blue hydraulic line. Later aircraft, however, are fitted with both a stall protection device and have a larger blade diameter, which will allow the ram air turbine to be slightly more effective. We've modeled our ram air turbine physics on later aircraft, as these are much more numerous now, and these tend to be effective until between 93 and 100 knots, below which they stop working. Now let's jump back into our nice static flight deck and talk about some more fun bits and pieces. To start with, I mentioned that we needed to program the startup and shutdown routines for different equipment, components, and computers. Now, a fun way to demonstrate this is to show you a nifty little routine that ELAC1 goes through when you reset it. Let's set some trim here. And then let's head up to the overhead and we'll push the ELAC1 push button. So let's turn that off. We'll wait a little while and then we'll push it. Uh, we'll push it in just to get it to start back up again. And as we head down, you'll see here in just a moment, there you go, it's resetting the trim back to zero. It's just one of those little behaviors that's not like particularly well documented, but was pretty fun to include. Another part of the challenge when modeling the off or interrupted power state of panels, buttons, and switches is programming or implementing their redundancy schemes. Everyone knows and hears about generator failures or IDG failures, engine failures, all of that big stuff. But we've also wired in buttons, switches, and panels to the electrical system and given you the ability to not only fail them, but pop the circuit breakers. We've had to, of course, introduce specific behaviors and fallback configurations that Airbus have built into the real deal into the Phoenix. Now, a really cool example of this is the FCU. Most of you use this thing pretty much every flight, and I imagine quite a lot of you never really thought about what happens should the FCU lose power. 
I mean, why would you? It's a simulator. You just input stuff into this device that is essentially omnipresent and a portal for sending information to other bits of the airplane, nothing more. Often, even if you can fail a component, it's not so often you can actually pop the circuit breaker off just to observe its behavior without power. So let's pop the FCU circuit breakers off and kill some power to it, and then we'll observe what the airplane does. Okay, so there are two circuit breakers here. The first one on the overhead, Autoflight FCU-1. So let's pull that really quick. In the interest of redundancy, of course, there are two. If we pop just the one off, it'll be fine. As you can see, it still works. Everything is A-OK. -okay. Uh, all of this is perfectly fine. No issues there. Now, if we pull the second on the back wall, though. So there you are. There's FCU-2. So let's pop that one. And as you can see, the uh, FCU is now dead. Um, the FCU is completely gone. And what happens here is quite fascinating um, because in addition to no longer having FCU control, um, you also no longer have control over the EFIS control panel. So this does not work. It's not changing anything. It's, it's all just dead, right? So you can't change the display configuration. Now the airplane knows this and it senses the fact that this panel is no longer functional um, it's not getting any feedback from it, so it goes, okay, that's dead. And what it does is it drops the aircraft's displays into a catch-all display configuration. So it amalgamates the displays to show you a set of rational defaults while still trying to show you as much information as possible. Drops the airplane into nav mode at a 40-mile range. It gives you one ADF. Uh, you can see that it gives you one ADF and one VOR. Um, and it gives you the standard Q&H. LS is on, right? And the bird, you also get the bird, so the FPA marker. It's really cool stuff, and it's not really one that you think about. Now, of course, both circuit breakers that we pulled were green, uh, and that means that they're monitored by the ECAM. So the ECAM is telling us circuit breaker tripped rear panel, circuit breaker tripped on the overhead panel, and of course, we're getting auto flight FCU 1 plus 2 fault, PFD barrel ref standard only. So this, this barrel ref right here, this still works fine, right? There's no problems with this. But, uh, of course, we can't change the barrel ref there, so it's letting us know that that is the case. Now, if I head down to the MCDU for just a second, and I head over to Failures, Auto Flight, and let's start going further down. So you can see, I can fail FCU Channel 1 and 2, which will yield the same result. But I popped the circuit breakers so you guys could see that even the panels are drawing power from the aircraft's electrical network. This extends out to the enunciators behind the push buttons as well. So these right here, even the lighting for these is correctly wired into their respective power sources. Um, I can demonstrate this by really quickly pulling the circuit breaker for flight warning computer one on the overhead. So there you are, FWC1 supply. So we've just pulled that. And uh, it won't be enough to trigger a... It won't be enough to trigger a master warning, but we will get a little message in the ECAM. There you are, FWS, FWC1 fault. So what is the FWC? Flight warning computer. It's responsible for presenting failures and status information on the upper and lower ECAM. And one of the other important utilities of the flight warning computers is the generation and triggering of visual and oral warnings. And that includes these master caution and master warning push buttons and enunciators right here. Now, there are two flight warning computers on the A320. Flight Warning Computer 1 is wired into the AC Essential bus, and Flight Warning Computer 2 is wired into the AC2 bus. Now, here we have a demonstration of how dynamically you can interact with the system. So, we can pop the circuit breaker off for FWC1, and you can see what happens is we get this little warning, but no master caution. So, let's pull the circuit breakers for the FCU again, and let's trigger a, uh, a quick warning. So FCU2, so there you are. So that's the, those are the circuit breakers required for FCU1 and FCU2. And as you can see, the FCU is now dead. But also, weirdly, you get a master caution, but it's only half lit. Now, the reason for this is redundancy. Airbus wired the master line of this enunciator to FWC1 and the caution part of this enunciator to FWC2, but only on the captain's side. So if you go over to the first officer's side, you can see there, 
So you've got the top half of that master is wired uh, to two and caution is wired to one. So you get the opposite effect. Now we pop the circuit breaker for flight warning computer one, which means that we essentially inhibited it from working by almost just hitting the off switch. You can see with components and even the stuff that you can't touch or feel directly, these are still wired into the electrical network. So this is the same for master warning. If we go to the overhead and we do a quick fire test, you'll be able to see this effect. So two computers, two lights on each side and cross wired for maximum uh, redundancy. Let's try and uh, trigger trigger that warning, shall we? The um, the fire test. So here you can just about see the test button and uh, looking at the enunciators here, you'll be able to see the pattern. So there you go. So you've got the pattern there for the enunciators. Again, they're wired differently. So they ensure that uh, with FWC one or two inoperative, you're still getting the messages that you need. Okay, another good example of this is the engine master switches. Now these send a electrical signal for the switch position and are of course considered rather essential. So this panel right here, this is wired into the DC essential bus. Now what this means is if you fail the DC essential bus, hilariously you no longer have control over the engines from this panel. You can't shut them down and nothing works because the panel's power supply has been cut off. So how do you turn off the engines after a DC essential failure? So let's just quickly trigger a DC essential failure. Right, so you get all of the uh, all of the terrible messages and whatnot, and then you realize I've just I've just pulled engine two master to off, and nothing's happening. Right, so it says it even warns you. It says fuel engine two LP valve open. So that's the low pressure valve right there. Now that is stuck open because it reads and it basically says, oh, I see that this switch, you know, this this is not something that I'm able to read. So I have no idea what's going on here. Um, so bit of an interesting one. Now the FCOM, there's a little note at the bottom for a DC essential fault. And that little note at the bottom reads, in order to shut down the engines on the ground, what you need to do is you need to push Let's say we want to switch off engine one. You need to push this uh, fire push button, right? And only when you do that will the engine finally shut down. So what this does is it closes this low pressure valve. And after a few seconds, once all the fuel has drained out of the engine, it'll shut down. So it's just going to take a sec for all the fuel to be utilized inside the engine. So again, we're simulating the fluids there. So the fluids need to be used up because it closes that low pressure valve. And then you can see after a little while, the engine starts to shut down. One last final bit before I let you all go. The MCDU and the FMGC. Now the FMGC stands for Flight Management Guidance Computer. The MCDU and the FMGC are two distinctly different components, despite them very rarely being separated when we talk about them. The MCDU stands for the Multipurpose Control and Display Units, and the clue is in the name. It's simply a device to provide inputs. The FMGCs, on the other hand, handle all the really critical stuff. So navigation, flight planning, performance optimization and predictions, and display management all the way up to things like the flight director, autopilot, and auto thrust commands, and even flight envelope computation, maneuvering speed computation, and things all the way up to wind shear detection. Um, now, the FMGCs normally receive information from on-side sensors and then talk to one another to validate that data. So, for example, the flight director on the one side, so the captain's side, is driven by FMGC1. FMGC2 drives the flight director on the two side. So the master FMGC is determined by autopilot or flight director engagement. So if AP1 is on, FMGC1 is the master, so on and so forth. So let's pull the circuit breaker for the MCDU. And when doing that, you'll be able to see that there isn't actually much of an effect. So here is the circuit breaker for MCDU1. Just pulled that and what you'll see here is that it 
it goes into a bit of a failure mode, right? So not much happens. Now these MCDUs, like your PCs at home, occasionally they crash, they lock up, so a quick reset is required. So we've pulled the circuit breaker for this MCDU and you can see nothing hard has happened. There have been no mode reversions. Um, you know, there's, there's no ECAM memo, nothing like that. And that's because the MCDU is simply an input device. There's no flight critical computation going on there. Um, you can see that we're still in 1FD2, indicating the FMGCs are fine. Now let's reset this MCDU and we'll pull the circuit breaker for the flight man management guidance computer instead. So MCDU1 back in and you'll see it'll go through a quick startup procedure. There you are. And uh, of course, very quick because we only interrupted it for a short time. Um, and uh, we'll pull the circuit breaker for FMGC1. So that's right up there. Now, in the event of a loss uh, of an FMGC, the remaining FMGC will continue to operate normally. Now, if the lost FMGC was the master, then the autopilot and the auto thrust uh, will disengage and you need to engage the opposite autopilot. And subsequently, you will be able to re-engage auto thrust. Now, this is known as single mode and an amber FM1 uh, on the top of the MCDU. So you can see that there's a little FM1. Now this changes from uh, model to model. So on some it's amber, on others it's like this. Um, now this indicates as much. So this will be on the failed side. You get a little FM1 message there and you get an idea that the FMGC is now inhibited. Um, and you can see when we popped the circuit breaker off, there was actually a very short period of time. If you want to go back and have a look, there's a short period of time where 1FD2 remained on. It took a moment there to switch over. Now, this is because it has uh, the FMGCs, that is, has a power transient buffer. So it took a moment for that to run out. You can see that the navigation display is also telling us offside FM control. Now, uh, that is because we're basically mirroring this ND. So this is not going to work. It's going to get stuck on mode change. And the only way we get this to work again is to literally mirror the inputs. There you go. And now we have a working uh, navigation display. Now the FMGCs contain batteries, which can maintain power supply for a short while as seen. And also it will allow the FMGCs to store or keep entered data in the memory for at least 10 minutes. So if you cut off an FMGC's electrical supply and you come back after 15 or 20 minutes, it'll have dumped its memory out. But if you cut off an FMGC's electrical supply and immediately reconnect it, it won't need to resynchronize as much and go through its entire startup process. So let's go ahead and pop this FMGC circuit breaker back in again. And you can see it's popped straight back into life. No issues at all. Uh, no synchronization issues, nothing like that. So it's, it is just an example of how aiming to simulate everything in its absolute highest fidelity um, has given us some really cool effects with cascading kind of items, uh, you know, systems feeding into systems and whatnot. A uh, really, really fun way of, of going about learning the airplane. And with 282 functional circuit breakers on the aircraft, there is a lot for you to poke around here. I really hope that you guys enjoyed that uh, quick look at some of what we've modeled on the Phoenix A320's electrical system and that it helped showcase the absolute depth of system fidelity that we're going for on this aircraft. Thank you so very much for watching and have a lovely day everyone.